Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Petros Buras Vallanatos, and I'm a welcome lecturer in history of medicine at the University of Edinburgh. Uh, first of all, I would like, please, um, to ask you to keep your cameras off and your microphones muted. Thank you. Uh, it's a great pleasure for me uh, to introduce Paula, Paula DeVos. Uh, Paula uh, DeVos is professor of history at San Diego State University. She currently work focuses on the long history of Galenic pharmacy from the ancient Mediterranean to colonial Spanish America. She's co-editor of Science in the Spanish and Portuguese Empires, which was published by Stanford University Press in 2009, and has published a lot of uh, important articles on natural history and also history of early pharmacology and materia medica. Um, now, today, she will give uh, a talk about um, her forthcoming book entitled Compound Remedies, Galenic Pharmacy from the Ancient Mediterranean to New Spain, uh, which will be published by uh, University of Pittsburgh Press. So the Greek physician Gelin, uh, who died in the early 3rd century AD, wrote on a um, uh, wide range of topics, and his corpus constituted the main dogma in rational approaches in East uh, and West for almost uh, one and a half millennium. Uh, he composed a lot uh, of um, pharmacological works, codifying the ancient knowledge. And what's very important is that he always also um, uh, was trying to supplement um, uh, his material with his own views. Um, yet, Galenic pharmacology remains still very unexplored, and I hope I have briefly emphasized how significant would be Paula's contribution to understanding and appreciating both the Galenic pharmacology and also its reception. Um, I will now hand over to Paula, who will talk about her new book. To avoid um, technical difficulties, uh, the presentation has been recorded, but Paula is here uh, to answer your questions at the end uh, of uh, this session. Thank you. Hello. Uh, I wanted to start by thanking Petros for uh, chairing this panel and introducing me, and also thanking the conference organizers for doing such a fantastic job on this conference and, and what are difficult times. Um, this has been a wonderful conference. I really enjoyed uh, the panels that I've attended, and I look forward to to uh, attending more as the conference proceeds. At any rate, I'm gonna be talking about um, my book today, uh, Compound Remedies uh, on Galenic Pharmacy from the Ancient Mediterranean to New Spain, uh, which traces the history of this pharmaceutical tradition, Galenic Pharmacy from the ancient Greco-Roman period through the Islamic um, empires of the Middle Ages to the, Lat whoops, the Latin West, um, uh, so the, the, to medieval Europe, uh, then into early modern Europe, and then going to Mexico through the Spanish Empire, and in particular, the urban um, centers uh, in colonial Mexico where the official colonial establishment uh, was, was in place. Um, so it's a book that covers a, a, a long period of time and, and a relatively large area, um, and it traces, as I said, um, the Galenic tradition. And um, we know a lot about um, Galenic medicine, humoral medicine, uh, but Galenic pharmacy, as I'll talk about in a minute, has received far less treatment um, in the secondary literature. And so in that sense, uh, while I didn't set out <laughs> to do such a sort of a, a broad and, and a broad study of the long durée, um, this is what I ended up doing in order to uh, be able to trace out the parameters of this tradition. Uh, so this project then began with um, an initial pre-dissertation uh, research trip to the National Archives in Mexico City. And I was, I was very interested in studying the history of natural history um, initially, and I went to the archives to investigate some uh, series of documents on uh, crown-sponsored expeditions, scientific expeditions to the Americas in the 18th century. Uh, and in doing so, I uncovered documents about the founding of a botanical garden in Mexico City 
and there was a discussion about how um, they were planning to tax um, apothecaries to uh, fund the garden. And two things sort of struck me with this. In the first place, uh, I didn't know what, I should say, the, the word in Spanish for apothecary is boticario, and I didn't know that word. When I looked it up and saw that it meant apothecary, um, then the question was, why would an apothecary be associated with a botanical garden? And that is what began my interest in apothecaries and uh, the history of pharmacy, and I have uh, pursued that ever since. Um, so in my dissertation, I wrote mainly about kind of the, the social and cultural aspects of pharmacy and medical practice in this, in a Catholic society. I looked at um, you know pharmaceutical regulations and uh, public health mat measures and, and taxation and things of that nature. And I did do some work on um, some research into the medicines and the, the, the various things that were contained within an apothecary shop. Um, but when it came time to write the book, I realized that what really, really interested me and fascinated me and what I really wanted to figure out was what these substances were, um, why these particular substances, how did they get to these pharmacies, and why were they thought to be um, medicinal? Because the, what I discovered in the archives were um, a series of cases, basically uh, civil lawsuits, some um, criminal uh, cases as well. Um, and within these cases, sometimes were these um, inventories that were many pages long. And they could be associated with, say, a pharmacist, say, an, an apothecary who had, who had, you know, was being sued because he hadn't paid his bills. Or sometimes you would have an apothecary who was being investigated by the Inquisition and his goods had been sequestered and inventoried. And so in these cases, there would be these inventories that were full of lists that would go on for pages and pages and list hundreds of medicinal substances, um, as well as equipment and books that were in that were kept in the pharmacies. And I was I I was really curious to understand again what these were, why they were there, and how they were uh, thought to work, how and why they were thought to work. And so when I then started with the book project, I decided that that's what I was going to be focusing on and then um, go about kind of tracing the, the history of the different components of the pharmacy. And that's what the book, that's how the book is largely structured according to an emblematic um, pharmacy inventory from 1775 that kind of structures the book. I begin each chapter um, of the book with um, sort of a snapshot of the, the contents in this pharmacy. It was a pharmacy of Don Jacinto de Herrera, and he had actually um, gotten in trouble. He'd had a he'd owned a pharmacy back in Spain and in Cadiz, and had owed somebody money, and then. Um, moved to Mexico and then um, the authorities were able to track him down. And at, at any rate, there's um, two very uh, long and complete inventories of his pharmacy within that case. So I chose that as sort of, again, an, an emblematic pharmacy to, to structure, as a way to structure the book. Um, and what I did in these, for these inventories too, I had, I actually collected an, a number of them mainly for the 18th century, as well as um, a few sets of prescriptions um, for various institutions and, and one household that, that um, go sort of through the 17th century as well. So I've got these sort of, these different sets of documents uh, that would sort of, again, name pharmacy con, um, contents and pharmaceuticals and then what I did was I would I transcribed them, and so this is just to show you an example of um, of just the very beginning of the the transcription I did of the um, Herrera shop. Uh, this is actually just the, only the first page um, of the seeds that were contained in in the shop. Um, it doesn't even contain all of the seeds. It's just to give you a sense of how many. Um, substances were in these pharmacy shops. And you can see that also in this next slide where you had, you know, 
stands um, and you know uh, shelving that would line all of the walls of, of the, the retail part of the, the shop um, full of jars and bottles and boxes of, of different kinds of materials. Um, and I should say, and um, Don Jacinto's shop as well, not only was there the, the retail part of the pharmacy, but there's also, he had a, a couple of storage rooms, and then there were two backroom kind of um, workshops or laboratories where the medicines were formulated. Um, there was also a stable that had broken equipment in it, and then he lived in, in um, he actually lived in quarters above the shop, and there were, he had lots of um, different uh, medicines in, in like in his living room, uh, as well as a number of different books. Um, so there's lots and lots, you know, hundreds of items that were in um, these shops. And again, were, were highlighted in these inventories. And this was what, this became kind of the basis of the study. Uh, what are these things? And then where did they come from? And you can see that in the book, this is the table of contents for the book. It's actually, this is the page from the page proof. So we don't actually have the page numbers in yet. Um, for the contents, but you can see that um, what I did was I took each type of ingredient or each type of, of, of thing that was in the pharmacy, and then I wrote a chapter about that, um, explaining what it was, the history of how it came about and how and why it was uh, uh, thought to work. And so, uh, for instance, chapter one talks about the simples in the pharmacy. So simples were these uh, single ingredients that were then processed and included in incorporated into um, compound compounded uh, remedies. So the first chapter is about uh, simples, what they were, how they were thought to work, and what they consisted of from you know the ancient Greco-Roman period and then and then through to the the 18th century and the changes that it underwent uh, along the way, the changes at the, the materia medica, the sort of the, the grouping of simples, the grouping of medicinal materials um, that were used. Um, and the one hand, there, it's sort of a, a long and stable tradition. On the other hand, there were additions made to this, the materia medica over time in, in various phases. Uh, chapter two then looks at the processing of the symbols and the equipment that was kept in the pharmacies and used to do that processing. And again, talks about why that processing took place and how it was thought to work um, in terms of enhancing or kind of modulating the medicinal powers of the symbols and then preparing them for inclusion into a compound remedy. So the third chapter then looks at compounds um, and the different kinds of compounds that were formulated. Uh, chapter four then looks at the American uh, the medicines that were in the pharmacies. So the um, plant, animal, and mineral materials, the medicinal materials that were indigenous to the Americas that then were added to the, um, to the European pharmacopoeia or the Galenic pharmacopoeia. And uh, then in chapter five, I look at the uh, alchemical medicines and equipment that were found in the 18th century pharmacies as well, looking into the history of that and how that, I call it sort of an alternative formulary that develops um, uh, through alchemical processing and then joins with Galenic Pharmacy sometime in the late 17th, early 18th century, um, or perhaps even mid 17th century. It's not exactly clear when that union um, begins, but you could certainly see it in place by the beginning of the 18th century in the Spanish uh, pharmaceutical tradition. Uh, so that's kind of how the book is organized, sort of pu pulling out each kind of facet of the contents of the pharmacy. And then again, starting with um, the, the Herrera Pharmacy as a way, as, as sort of a snapshot of it, and then delving into the question of, you know, why are these, why are these particular materials here? Um, and I will say that, actually, before I go into that one, I will say that when I began the research, I, I, I planned to focus, you know, mainly on, on colonial Mexico. But when I did some preliminary research into, you know, the, the Galenic tradition of pharmacy, I found very little in the way of synthetic works um, in the field. Now, that is not to give credit to some of the absolutely stellar key works, seminal works that um, that I relied upon in my research in terms of the secondary literature. But 
But as far as finding some sort of synthetic treatment of the simples, of the processing of the simples, of the compounds, of the alchemical uh, medicines and the history of those alchemical medicines and where they came from, um, and then the, the American medicines then that were included in the Galenic uh, tradition, uh, I could find very little in terms of, of synthetic work. And so I made the conscious decision then to go you know, back in time, um, back to the ancient period and also um, you know, across the Atlantic, across the, the Mediterranean and, and looking into uh, the Eastern Mediterranean where a lot of this tradition uh, originated and then, and then developed. Um, and so in that sense, as I said, this, the, the book is, um, has sort of a wide geographic um, uh, treatment as well as sort of a long durée. It, it covers, you know, um, a relatively uh, long um, period of time. And, and what I found, it, it, and I should say also, I went about, in addition um, to, you know, looking into the secondary literature, realizing that I needed to do um, you know, primary research into this tradition and, and find the outlines of this tradition. I'm, I made up a series of, uh, of sort of data collection, tallying, tallies of the, you know, the medicines, the simples and the compounds in the prescriptions, uh, the simples and compounds in the pharmacy inventories and the, the books and the equipment that were in there. Um, and then I correlated that with a pharmaceutical text that had been um, written, produced from through the ancient, medieval, and early modern period, so that on the one hand you could see this sort of backbone of this textual tradition, and then also compare it with um, pharmaceutical practice in in day to day life in colonial Mexico. Um, and in doing this this research, then I it, it sort of dawned on me late in the game that um, that what I was really researching was this Galenic uh, pharmaceutical tradition. And um, I found that it's it's certainly an identifiable tradition, a consistent tradition, um, and it's identifiable quite early on. Uh, it's a it's a, it's a very long and stable tradition in uh, in Western hi history. Uh, at the same time, it was also very dynamic, and it 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 changed and morphed over time, and especially in in certain key um, phases and key periods. And each of the chapters also identifies sort of these key periods and sort of moves roughly chronologically as well. So there's sort of a thematic focus with the chapters, but also sort of a rough chronology that will identify these key periods um, over time or these key sort of watershed moments over time. Um, and so what I did was, so I went back in time and found that Galen and Dioscorides, who lived in the first and second centuries CE in the Greco-Roman world, um, were ex extremely important for the formulating the, the basis of Galenic pharmacy. Uh, then my research took me into uh, the Islamic empires and the in, incredible work that was done by the physician philosophers of the Islamic empires, and in particular, uh, Avicenna, who produced the canons of medicine, uh, extremely important. And the, the significance of um, pharmacy and pharmaceutical theory to um, medicine and natural philosophy in the Middle Ages can be seen in in that the canons of medicine is divided into three, or I'm sorry, three into five um, basically books or five volumes. Three of the five volumes um, deal with pharmaceutical issues. Um, one of the volumes uh, is uh, includes information about materia medica. One of the volumes is basically a formulary of compound medicines. And then the first volume actually deals with natural philosophy and issues of cosmology that were directly related to pharmacy um, and matter theory. Uh, and then uh, I moved on to look into the Middle Ages and in particular found um, the extreme importance of Mesue or pseudo Mesue, uh, who was a pseudonymic author uh, whose works first appear in the 13th and 13th century, in the late 13th century in Northern Italy. Um, there are three pharmaceutical works that um, were incredibly important for bringing the developments and the advancements uh, in uh, Islamic pharmacy 
I should say Arabic pharmacy to the Latin West, to Europe. So these, um, as I said, appeared in Northern Italy and uh, the, his, his treatises really um, are not only important for being a conduit for the Arabic pharmacy, but they added new ideas and new developments as well based on the, the Latin translations of Arabic works coming into medieval Europe that were themselves uh, translations and commentaries of earlier Greek works, but also with great sort of advances and progress made um, in the Arabic works um, through commentaries and through disputes and, and doubts about some of the ancient Greek works. And then the 13th century Latin translations take all of this um, sort of knowledge and advancement into, into account and then add their own. And you see this in, in Mezzoe's work and then Mezzoe's work becomes the foundational basis um, for early modern Spanish pharmacy. Um, and I would argue um, for Galenic pharmacy generally, uh, if you just do a sort of a cursory look at any major early modern formulary, you will see the evidence of, of Mezue there, of pseudo Mezue there. Uh, so this is, these were sort of my findings in terms of the, the large scale um, scope of the book and um, the, sort of the ways that the chapters are arranged. But now I wanna talk about um, some of the larger conclusions that I draw not only in the book, but that sort of go beyond the book and have implications for the field of the history of pharmacy, history of science and medicine more generally, and things that, that we can uh, pay attention to uh, as we uh, go further in, in this research. Uh, so in the first place, um, I would encourage, or what I argue in the book and what I would encourage um, scholars to think about is to recognize connections between the medieval Mediterranean world and the Spanish Empire. These are two areas that that um, you know might not seem uh, you know closely connected um, at first glance or when you know first thinking about them. But um, the the importance of the Arabic uh, intellectual tradition for Spain is obvious in the sense that um, Spain was under Islamic rule for 700 years. Uh, and in addition to that, the, and, and I should say, so so there's there's that influence, but just the um, the importance of the Arabic inheritance and the intellectual inheritance generally would have an impact on Galenic medicine and Galenic pharmacy. Um, and in this way, then um, you know, colonial Mexico under the Spanish Empire would have certainly been a part of this larger world, um, and. Related to that too, then I would encourage people to think about decentering uh, accepted binaries of West and East, sort of an orientalized East um, that the Islamic empires would be considered a part of. Uh, what I found in my research is that what is happening um, in the Arabic scholarship is really providing the foundations for what we would consider to be Western science and Western medicine. Um, so I would, I, I really think we need to rethink um, and decenter these kinds of binaries, and also binaries of center and periphery, um, you know, metropolitan and colonial, uh, and in the sense that um, you know we can learn something about Galenic pharmacy, the Mediterranean world, European history from the vantage point of colonial Mexico. It's not just a you know, a derivative of sort of a, a, a European norm, um, we can we can learn something about this world from Mexico. Um, and in that sense too, and this is this idea is related to, to both of these conclusions, is recognizing the flow of knowledge, ideas, practices, materials, and texts over time and place. So that knowledge doesn't um, arise and stay within the boundaries of the modern nation state. Um, you know, the the and I'll, this is getting to my next point, but the Renaissance didn't just you know rise up suddenly from from nothing. Um, you know, different eras influence each other, and we should also I think rethink some periodization as well. Uh, you know, within the history of science and medicine. So along these lines as well, I think we need to recognize the sophistication of Arabic medicine. 
the influences that it's had on uh, the Latin West, on early modern Europe, um, and question narratives that only emphasize the impact of the Renaissance, and in particular, Renaissance humanism um, and the purification and quote unquote rediscovery of ancient texts, because those Arabic commentaries of, and translations of the Greek works, and then the Latin commentaries and translations of the um, Arabic works added a tremendous amount of, of knowledge to the the sort of the Greco-Roman, um, you know, the Greco-Roman natural philosophy and 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 medicine. And we need to recognize that. And in fact, in my experience um, and in, in reading, you know, in my own research, uh, what I find is by no means a, a sense of a denigration of, you know, Arabic uh, work, but instead a real a, a lionization of it. And, and they saw Avicenna and Mezue as, as the great heroes of medicine and pharmacy. And that continues through the 18th century. Uh, so kind of rethinking that um, and then also recognizing the key role of pharmacy in ancient medieval and early modern understandings of cosmology and especially matter theory. Um, so that pharmacy and, and looking at um, ideas about how it is that medicines work and medicinal powers um, has a, a has major um, significance for matter theory and for what natural philosophers thought things were made of. What are the elements and how do these elements combine and what are the powers of these elements and can you remove certain powers from substances and concentrate them um, in order to make them more effective. So the you know pharmaceutical formulation uh, had a lot of um, had a lot to do with matter theory and how it was conceived. And I would argue that the 13th century in particular and Mezzoe's work um, was a, a key moment in um, changing ideas about matter theory and techniques for manipulating matter that then would would um, set the stage for uh, the changes in matter theory and the development of chemistry in the early modern era and then the rejection of Aristotelianism or Ar Aristotelian matter theory. So that hopefully gives you a sense of what the book is about and its major conclusions. And there is certainly more work that needs to be done on Galenic pharmacy and sort of uh, filling out uh, some of the more uh, nuanced parts of the overview that I have um, given in this book. And I hope that you enjoy it. Uh, thank you for this opportunity and I look forward to your questions. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Paula. Um, so we have um, um, some time for questions. Please uh, use the chat function. Um, now, uh, there are already three questions. So um, the first question is by Gregor Higby and is as follows. Were there any exotic natural history items uh, such as stuffed reptiles, etc.? in the Mexican inventories? That's an interesting question, I think. And so I think maybe part of this goes into, is this sort of a collection of curiosities? Like I think um, I've seen an article by Valentina Puliano who writes about, you know, sort of the, the Italian pharmacies as, um, as these sort of cabinets of curiosity and, you know, natural history. And I thought, I thought that was excellent work and an excellent observation. Uh, on her part, from from my own research, I did not find things like this, you know, the stuffed stuffed reptiles or um, reference to any kind of objects of that nature. What you what I would see in the inventories were like uh, lots of religious sort of re altars, reliquaries, um, that kind of thing. There was more religious accoutrements that they would document. I never, I mean, now that you're asking, I never did see that in a pharmacy. Um, in terms of sort of things that were stuffed or just sort of things that were there for interest's sake, I would say, I mean, this brings up a whole issue of the exotic that um, that I've kind of been thinking about because there is this sort of work lately on ex exotic remedies. And, and the point I would make sort of going along with my larger conclusions is thinking about what's exotic for whom, 
because you know these are Afro-Eurasian symbols brought to Mexico, and so they were foreign. They were exotic, in a, if you wanted, you know, for at least for you know indigenous people there. But they were largely transplanted, and then they were appropriated in. Um, you know, even in contemporary uh, folk healing traditions throughout Mexico and the U.S. Southwest, some of the main ingredients in the, you know, the main medicines used are, you know, rue and sage and, you know, things like that. So, so in that sense, you could say it's sort of exotic. The whole thing is exotic. Um, and, the, and, and I will also say that, you know, there was, you know, snakes were used widely in, you know, in, in you know, formulating medicines and things like that. So they certainly had snakes scorpions, you know, um, trying to think, uh, you know, the, the kinds of the, the animal parts and the animal processing that is going on certainly would have been, there, there would have been lots of animals and animal parts in these in these pharmacies. Um, but I didn't see, you know, what Puliano saw for Italy in Mexico. That's a good question. Great. Thank you, Bola. So the next question is by Luke Richard. Um, how many simples still serve as a part of ingredients in homeopathic herbal and over-the-counter remedies? So what does the book perhaps suggest at the present moment, if anything? That, I have to say, that's a that's a really good question, too. And as I was going through, you know, as I was doing my research, um, I, I shop at this sort of more natural grocery store. And I, you know, in their sort of over-the-counter, you know, the sort of pharmacy medicinal part of the store, I started to recognize all kinds of things that I would see in the pharmacies. And I started to think, wait a minute, there's that tradition is still here. It's not dead in a sense, but I, I need to do more research on this. But what I suspect or what I think has happened is in the 19th century, um, you have the allopathic medicine and then and you guys in the modern people will know this better than I do, but then naturopathic, homeopathic it splits and the allopathic gets the, you know, the support of the scientific and medical community and the governments. Um, yet this other tradition continues. Um, and this is, and I think what happens is that, that the, the, um, the simples and the compound, the, the simples mainly, but also the compounds in the pharmacies then start to become part of, the, they stay as part of the homeopathic and the naturopathic remedies. Um, the materials that they use and herbal medicine as well. The materials they use are largely continuous in that way. And there's this concept of the medicinal power. And um, if anyone's ever taken homeopathic remedies, you there are these little sugar pills. And again, you probably know this better than I do, but where the, the, the power of the simple, the energy of it is, is concentrated in the middle. And it's actually not even considered to be material anymore. And that to me is, is the extreme extent of what Mezzoe is arguing about medicinal powers and how you can, um, he argues that you can um, start to process these things in a way that you can you can start to isolate and, and modify the medicine's powers. So I do see these things continuing. And that's part of what I, I, I think my future research would, I'd love to, to go into that more. Um, or th this would be a great research project for somebody to to think about doing. I mean, I think I don't think I made this point um, in the in the presentation, but this this is sort of an, an overview. And there's so many things to still fill out and figure out from this as well. It's sort of I see this as sort of a first <laughs> a first first run at this, and then we'll see what what happens over time. So. Anyway, yeah. So uh, the next question about the actual writing of the book by Del Rio. So what was the most challenging part of researching this book? How <sighs> many languages did you have to incorporate? And did you come across any surprises uh, that couldn't be covered in the <gasps> book? Uh, Paul, I would like to ask you to be a little bit brief now because we have, a, we have more questions. So if you can be a little bit briefer in your okay. response, we, we allow some time for the other questions. As well. Okay, all right, I'll try to be brief. Uh, that's, a, that's an awesome question. Well, I'll tell you this, this book took me, I think about 12 years um, to write. What was supposed to just come, you know, I, I got tenure with articles, come back to the dissertation, turn it into a book, you know, and then, and I made, you know, I, I started to realize early on what what I needed to know, and I made the decision to take the time to do this. Um, and I would say that was probably the biggest challenge was it, how long it took. Um, 
and uh, you know the frustrations that go along with that too. As far as languages go, um, I have studied you know Spanish, French, Portuguese, and by the time you've studied that and Latin, then Italian again read Italian. Um, the German I had to get help with and do um, sort of tran you know translating on my own. Uh, with that. Um, and then for the Arabic works, well, for the Greek works, I relied on, you know, English translations for the Arabic. I also relied on English, um, you know, critical editions that thankfully researchers have started to to put forth. Um, but um, as Petros and I were talking about before the, the panel started, there's so little translated that I've actually started to take Arabic because if I'm going to go further, I would like to do more reading. I'm going to have to learn Arabic. So that's those are the challenges, I guess. Great. So the next question is by Joseph Gabriel. Uh, could you comment on how the pharmacist you write about thought about effectiveness and what this meant at the time? Effectiveness. That that's always a difficult question when you're doing early medicine because it's hard to know what what disease are they talking about. How would we understand that in the modern world? Um, what do they mean by a medicine being effective? And these ideas and how they talk about it change over time. Um, so what I did with that is I I just go back to Dioscorides because he provides the basis that really stays in place through the 18th century even into the 19th century. And I looked at I, I I looked at what he said about you know how things work, um, and it's it's mainly sort of this humoral idea of you know it's purging this, it's rebalancing this, um, it's you know it's a it's a cathartic, it's it's drying this up, um, it's moisturizing this. That's the kind of the extent of how people talked about effectiveness. Um, but that's a tough. That is a sort of a thorny question that I think we don't have a, a good answer to. And, and another thing that could be traced out is how are they talking about these medicines in terms of what they're used for and how are they measuring whether or not they're effective? And I have to say also, I didn't really pay much attention to, um, to that idea of effectiveness or does something work or how do you choose the right simple as that would have been more in the, what physicians would have been concerned with rather than what the, the formulation of it and what is this made of and how can you manipulate it to make it as effective as possible is more of what I was interested or more of what I looked at. But um, I don't know if that answers the question, but but it raises some yeah. big questions in early modern medicine. So. Yeah, okay, I, thanks, I Paula. Uh, so the next question by uh, Malika Basu. Uh, in your study, what sort of Arabic medicines you were talking? Can you please elaborate? And even in our Indian perspective, we have a very good interactions with India and Arab practitioners in the medieval period. Mm -hmm. um, so as far as the Arabic medicines, what I found was that they, um, they were sort of using a Greek base, translating a Greek basis but it was still cons the simples consisted of a, a whole you know series of substances um, that were from the Mediterranean world, um, but also from what I call the Indo-Mediterranean and that area that had been covered by the Hellenistic empires and that had a, a long period of interaction as you're you're talking about um, you know in the in sort of early world history and and trade. Um, but what I did find is that during the the Islamic empires and the sort of the world systems of trade that developed then, there's a whole new set of mainly Eastern simples that get added into the Galenic um, Materia Medica um, that mainly come from India and East Asia that hadn't been, you know, part of it under the, the Greeks. Um, it sort of gets expanded and then there's this this sort of set that's added, added to it. Um, so I I think it's and oh and then one other thing I'll say that's the simples and then with the compounds, um, because of the influence of India, Arabic pharmacy starts to use cane sugar and they can it's so versatile they they start to develop there's several different sort of new compounds that are added to the formulary particularly syrups, um, but also um, lambatit like um these things that you would lick. Uh, and things like that. So they they add in a whole series of new compounds, um, and really 
set the basis for the formulary is what I argue. So. Okay, the next question is by uh, David Hertberg. Uh, are there any insights that you got from studying culture like pharmacy stocks that were not visible or as visible for more discursive textual records? I'm thinking about your points um, regarding the centering binaries of east, west, center, periphery, etc. That's interesting. What I actually found, what I was surprised about, was that the stock, the pharmacy stock, um, very much mirrored the textual tradition. They went very much hand in hand, even in Mexico, even in the far reaches of the Spanish Empire, and you know Chihuahua, for instance, you would have a pharmacy that was stocked with all the Galenic stuff that very much went along with the text. That and they had, you know, Mesoway and Dioscorides in the pharmacies um, that they would, you know, consult. And so I was struck by how much they went hand in hand, or at least the, the medicines and the pharmacies were sort of a subset of what you would see in the text. They didn't have as much variety, but they were surprisingly closely aligned. And that was another reason why I thought, okay, I'm gonna need to go and trace this tradition because I didn't I didn't expect that. I expected them to be a bit um, different. Uh, what I did was able to see in terms of differences was in the prescriptions. Um, those were things that, you know, you can see what's in a pharmacy, but how much was that were the materials used? We don't know, but in the prescriptions, we know this is being prescribed to somebody and somebody's taking it. Um, and and actually, in those the prescriptions, there was a distinct lack of American Native American substances, and I I was really surprised about that. I mean, so it it really sort of follows Galenic pharmacy very very closely. Um, I think, uh, and that complicates our ideas about center and periphery because you would think it would be different and altered and changed by this environment. But what I argue is that. The urban centers in colonial Mexico very much mirrored the metropolitan cities in, in Spain. Um, they were highly Hispanized, um, and you can see that in the in Galenic medicine. So I mean, not that they weren't somewhat altered, but I I I did not find much which I had expected to. So thank you so much, Paula. So may I ask the, the last question? Um, um, I was wondering whether we can see um, to what extent we can see uh, an engagement by these apothecaries in New Spain um, um, or on the actual Galenic um, uh, remedies or these, I mean, these recipes that uh, um, they were received from um, from uh, Arabic through Latin. I mean, we know that period, I mean, especially in the Islamic world, uh, um, a lot of authors, I mean, criticized or or uh, uh, provide modification in Galen compound remedies. We know that Al Razi criticized Galen that he was not aware of the method of distillation. We know mm -hmm. that Al Kindi, for example, um, uh, criticized his um, a method of um, calculating the the powers in compound drugs. So, can mm -hmm. we see any sort of uh, uh, critical engagement with the Galen remedies uh, in compound remedies in um, in New Spain or? Um, there is no sort of this theoretical uh, understanding. There, there is only a sort of practical uh, reception. Yeah, no, w one thing that, and this goes back to the challenges of the study as well, I think is that I really did not uncover the pharmacist, the apothecary's voice. The way I learned about it was, you know, through the, when they're getting in trouble, you know, in the law or, you know, they're interviewed by the inquisition, but that's all about theological matters. Um, I don't have any apothecaries reflecting on their own practice, which is, uh, it would be wonderful. There is some of that for Spain later um, in, in Spain when they're setting up, um, you know, pharmacy schools and things like that. So I don't, I don't have any evidence of them criticizing Galen. But what I would argue is that Mesoway's work largely puts a lot of that to rest in the sense of, on the one hand, um, the doubts and the the, um, the criticisms of Galen, I mean, they, Avicenna and Averroes largely, I think, kind of answer a lot of that. Uh, and then Mezue incorporates that into his work. Um, and then, you know, in that sense, you know, the, say the controversy over the compound powers and how to calculate them, he says, oh, okay, you know, whatever, it's a, it's a, a, a unitary, 
he calls it a, a unitary p compound power. So he doesn't, he sort of sidesteps the issue. He doesn't make a decision about how you calculate it. All he says is what we really have to do as, as pharmacists is make sure that we are preserving that power and mixing it, you know, and, and processing the materials in such a way that we're getting the, the optimum power and that it's not going to um, dissipate and go stale, you know, and that kind of thing. So it's, I think he solves a lot of this and kind of moves away from, they're, they're not really, they're not natural philosophers or physicians anymore. It's apothecaries. So their concerns start are different as they get more professionalized, I think. So I would say that might be a reason why I you know, I, I mean, it's a it's a lack of sources, but I never I didn't see any sense of critique, except when they're talking about the use of mercury. There was um, at one point there was a um, an issue about that. So anyway, sorry. thank you so much, Paula. <laughs> I would like uh, to thank you for your wonderful and inspired talk. And uh, I think all of us look forward to reading uh, your book. Many congratulations on this achievement, and um, I think uh, this is the end of the session. Uh, so the next session is Panel 9, Breakthroughs and Ethics. So let us thank uh, Paula. Oh, thank you. And thank you. Uh, I think it's time to end the session. Thank you, Paula. Thank okay. you very much. And thank you, all of you, for arranging this uh, online meeting, which I think worked great. Thank